Section 23 of Inca Lands. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Inca Lands by Hiram Bingham. Chapter 14, Part 1. Chapter 14, Conservidayoc. When Don Pedro Duque of Santa Aria was helping us to identify places mentioned in Calancha and Ocampo, the references to Vilcabamba Viejo, or Old Vilcapampa, were supposed by two of his informants to point to a place called Conservidayoc. Don Pedro told us that in 1902, López Torres, who had traveled much in the montaña looking for rubber trees, reported the discovery there of the ruins of an Inca city. All of Don Pedro's friends assured us that Conservidayoc was a terrible place to reach. No one now living had been there. It was inhabited by savage Indians who would not let strangers enter their villages. When we reached Paltaibamba, Señor Pancorbo's manager confirmed what we had heard. He said further that an individual named Saavedra lived at Conservidayoc and undoubtedly knew all about the ruins, but was very averse to receiving visitors. Saavedra's house was extremely difficult to find. No one had been there recently and returned alive. Opinions differed as to how far away it was. Several days later, while Professor Foote and I were studying the ruins near Rosaspata, Señor Pancorbo, returning from his rubber estate in the San Miguel Valley and learning at Lucma of our presence nearby, took great pains to find us and see how we were progressing. When he learned of our intention to search for the ruins of Conservidayoc, he asked us to desist from the attempt. He said Saavedra was a very powerful man, having many Indians under his control, and living in grand state, with fifty servants, and not at all desirous of being visited by anybody. The Indians were of the Campa tribe, very wild and extremely savage. They use poisoned arrows and are very hostile to strangers. Admitting that he had heard there were Inca ruins near Saavedra's station, Señor Pancorbo still begged us not to risk our lives by going to look for them. By this time, our curiosity was thoroughly aroused. We were familiar with the current stories regarding the habits of savage tribes who lived in the montaña and whose services were in great demand as rubber gatherers. We had even heard that Indians did not particularly like to work for Señor Pancorbo, who was an energetic, ambitious man, anxious to achieve many things, results which required more laborers than could easily be obtained. We could readily believe there might possibly be Indians at Conservidayoc who had escaped from the rubber estate of San Miguel. Undoubtedly, Señor Pancorbo's own life would have been at the mercy of their poisoned arrows. All over the Amazon basin, the exigencies of rubber gatherers had caused tribes visited with impunity by the explorers of the 19th century to become so savage and revengeful as to lead them to kill all white men at sight. Professor Foote and I considered the matter in all its aspects. We finally came to the conclusion that in view of the specific reports regarding the presence of Inca ruins at Conservidayoc, we could not afford to follow the advice of the friendly planter. We must at least make an effort to reach them, meanwhile taking every precaution to avoid arousing the enmity of the powerful Saavedra and his savage retainers. On the day following our arrival at the town of Vilcabamba, the gobernador, Condoré, taking counsel with his chief assistant, had summoned the wisest Indians living in the vicinity, including a very picturesque old fellow whose name, Kispicusi, was strongly reminiscent of the days of Titucusi. It was explained to him that this was a very solemn occasion and that an official inquiry was in progress. He took off his hat, but not his knitted cap, and endeavored, to the best of his ability, to answer our questions about the surrounding country. It was he who said that the Inca Tupac Amaru once lived at Rosaspata. He had never heard of Huilcapampa Viejo, but he admitted that there were ruins in the montaña near Conservidayoc. Other Indians were questioned by Condoré. Several had heard of the ruins of Conservidayoc, but apparently none of them, nor any one in the village had actually seen the ruins or visited their immediate vicinity. They all agreed that Saavedra's place was at least four days' hard journey on foot in the montaña beyond Pampaconas. No village of that name appeared on any map of Peru, although it is frequently mentioned in the documents of the 16th century. 
Rodríguez de Figueroa, who came to seek an audience with Titu Cusi about 1565, says that he met Titu Cusi at a place called Bambaconas. He says further that the Inca came there from somewhere down in the dense forests of the montaña and presented him with the macaw and two hampers of peanuts, products of a warm region. We had brought with us the large sheets of Raimondi's invaluable map which covered this locality. We also had the new map of South Peru and North Bolivia, which had just been published by the Royal Geographical Society and gave a summary of all available information. The Indians said that Conservidayoc lay in a westerly direction from Vilcabamba, yet on Raimondi's map all of the rivers which rise in the mountains west of the town are short affluents of the Apurimac and flow southwest. We wondered whether the stories about ruins at Conservidayoc would turn out to be as barren of foundation as those we had heard from the trustworthy foreman at Huadquiña. One of our informants said the Inca city was called Espiritu Pampa, or the Pampa of Ghosts. Would the ruins turn out to be ghosts? Would they vanish on the arrival of white men with cameras and steel measuring tapes? No one at Vilcabamba had seen the ruins, but they said that at the village of Pampaconas, about five leagues from here, there were Indians who had actually been to Conservidayoc. Our supplies were getting low. There were no shops nearer than Lucma. No food was obtainable from the natives. Accordingly, notwithstanding the protestations of the hospitable gobernador, we decided to start immediately for Conservidayoc. At the end of a long day's march up the Vilcabamba Valley, Professor Foote, with his accustomed skill, was preparing the evening meal, and we were both looking forward with satisfaction to enjoying large cups of our favorite beverage. Several years ago, when traveling on muleback across the great plateau of southern Bolivia, I had learned the value of sweet, hot tea as a stimulant and bracer in the high Andes. At first astonished to see how much tea the Indian arrieros drank, I learned from sad experience that it was far better than cold water, which often brings on mountain sickness. This particular evening, one swallow of the hot tea caused consternation. It was the most horrible stuff imaginable. Examination showed small, oily particles floating on the surface. Further investigation led to the discovery that one of our arrieros had that day placed our can of kerosene on top of one of the loads. The tin became leaky and the kerosene had dripped down into a food box. A cloth bag of granulated sugar had eagerly absorbed all the oil it could. There was no remedy but to throw away half of our supply. As I have said, the longer one works in the Andes, the more desirable does sugar become, and the more one seems to crave it. Yet we were unable to procure any here. After the usual delays, caused in part by the difficulty of catching our mules, which had taken advantage of our historical investigations to stray far up the mountain pastures, we finally set out from the boundaries of known topography, headed for Conservidayoc, a vague place surrounded with mystery a land of hostile savages, albeit said to possess the ruins of an Inca town. Our first day's journey was to Pampaconas. Here, and in its vicinity, the gobernador told us he could procure guides and the half-dozen carriers, whose services we should require for the jungle trail where mules could not be used. As the Indians hereabouts were averse to penetrating the wilds of Conservidayoc, and were also likely to be extremely alarmed at the sight of men in uniform, the two gendarmes who were now accompanying us were instructed to delay their departure for a few hours and not to reach Pampaconas with our pack train until dusk. The gobernador said that if the Indians of Pampaconas caught sight of any brass buttons coming over the hills, they would hide so effectively that it would be impossible to secure any carriers. Apparently this was due in part to that love of freedom which had led them to abandon the more comfortable towns for a frontier village where landlords could not call on them for forced labor. Consequently, before the arrival of any such striking manifestations of official authority as our gendarmes, the gobernador and his friend Mogrovejo proposed to put in the day craftily commandeering the services of a half-dozen sturdy Indians. Their methods will be described presently. Leaving modern Vilcabamba, we crossed the flat, marshy bottom of an old glaciated valley in which one of our mules got thoroughly mired while searching for the succulent grasses which cover the treacherous bog. Fording the Vilcabamba River, which here is only a tiny brook, 
we climbed out of the valley and turned westward on the mountains above us were vestiges of several abandoned mines it was their discovery in fifteen seventy two or thereabouts which brought ocampo and the first spanish settlers to this valley raimondi says that he found here cobalt nickel silver bearing copper ore and lead sulphide he does not mention any gold bearing quartz it may have been exhausted long before his day as to the other minerals the difficulties of transportation are so great that it is not likely that mining will be renewed here for many years to come at the top of the pass we turned to look back and saw a long chain of snow-capped mountains towering above and behind the town of vilcabamba we searched in vain for them on our maps raimondi followed by the royal geographical society did not leave room enough for such a range to exist between the rivers apurimac and urubamba mr hendrickson determined our longitude to be seventy three degrees west and our latitude to be thirteen degrees eight minutes south yet according to the latest map of this region published in the preceding year this was the very position of the river apurimac itself near its junction with the river pampas we ought to have been swimming the great speaker actually we were on top of a lofty mountain pass surrounded by high peaks and glaciers the mystery was finally solved by mr bumstead in nineteen twelve when he determined the apurimac and the urubamba to be thirty miles farther apart than any one had supposed his surveys open an unexplored region fifteen hundred square miles in extent whose very existence had not been guessed before nineteen eleven it proved to be one of the largest undescribed glaciated areas in south america yet it is less than a hundred miles from cusco the chief city in the peruvian andes and the site of a university for more than three centuries that Pampa could so long defy investigation and exploration shows better than anything else how wisely manco had selected his refuge it is indeed a veritable labyrinth of snow-clad peaks unknown glaciers and trackless canyons looking west we saw in front of us a great wilderness of deep green valleys and forest-clad slopes we supposed from our maps that we were now looking down into the basin of the apurimac as a matter of fact we were on the rim of the valley of the hitherto uncharted pampaconas a branch of the cosireni one of the affluents of the urubamba instead of being the apurimac basin what we saw was another unexplored region which drained into the urubamba at the time however we did not know where we were but understood from condore that somewhere far down in the montaña below us was conservidayoc the sequestered domain of saavedra and his savage indians it seemed less likely than ever that the incas could have built a town so far away from the climate and food to which they were accustomed the road was now so bad that only with the greatest difficulty could we coax our sure-footed mules to follow it once we had to dismount as the path led down a long steep rocky stairway of ancient origin at last rounding a hill we came in sight of a lonesome little hut perched on a shoulder of the mountain in front of it seated in the sun on mats were two women shelling corn as soon as they saw the gobernador approaching they stopped their work and began to prepare lunch it was about eleven o'clock and they did not need to be told that senor condore and his friends had not had anything but a cup of coffee since the night before in order to meet the emergency of unexpected guests they killed four or five squealing cuis guinea pigs usually to be found scurrying about the mud floor of the huts of mountain indians before long the savory odor of roast cuy well basted and cooked to a turn on primitive spits whetted our appetites in the eastern united states one sees guinea pigs only as pets or laboratory victims never as an article of food in spite of the celebrated dogma that pigs is pigs this form of pork has never found its way to our kitchens even though these pigs live on a very clean vegetable diet incidentally guinea pigs do not come from guinea and are in no way related to pigs mr ellis parker butler to the contrary notwithstanding they belong rather to the same family as rabbits and belgian hares and have long been a highly prized article of food in the andes of peru the wild species are of a grayish-brown color which enables them to escape observation in their natural habitat the domestic varieties which one sees in the huts of the indians are piebald black white and tawny varying from one another in color as much as do the llamas 
which were also domesticated by the same race of people thousands of years ago. Although Anglo-Saxon folkways, as Professor Sumner would say, permit us to eat and enjoy long-eared rabbits, we draw the line at short-eared rabbits, yet they were bred to be eaten. I am willing to admit that this was the first time that I had ever knowingly tasted their delicate flesh, although once, in the capital of Bolivia, I thought the hotel kitchen had a diminishing supply. Had I not been very hungry, I might never have known how delicious a roast guinea pig can be. The meat is not unlike squab. To the Indians, whose supply of animal food is small, whose fowls are treasured for their eggs, and whose thin sheep are more valuable as wool-bearers than as mutton, the succulent guinea pig, most prolific of mammals, as was discovered by Mr. Butler's hero, is a highly valued article of food, reserved for special occasions. The North American housewife keeps a few tins of sardines and cans of preserves on hand for emergencies. Her sister in the Andes similarly relies on fat little cuis. After lunch, Condoré and Mogrovejo divided the extensive rolling countryside between them, and each rode quietly from one lonesome farm to another, looking for men to engage as bearers. When they were so fortunate as to find the man of the house at home or working in his little chakra, they greeted him pleasantly. When he came forward to shake hands, in the usual Indian manner, a silver dollar was unsuspectingly slipped into the palm of his right hand, and he was informed that he had accepted pay for services which must now be performed. It seemed hard, but this was the only way in which it was possible to secure carriers. During Inca times the Indians never received pay for their labor. A paternal government saw to it that they were properly fed and clothed, and either given abundant opportunity to provide for their own necessities, or else permitted to draw on official stores. In colonial days, a more greedy and less paternal government took advantage of the ancient system and enforced it without taking pains to see that it should not cause suffering. Then, for generations, thoughtless landlords, backed by local authority, forced the Indians to work without suitably recompensing them at the end of their labors or even pretending to carry out promises and wage agreements. The peons learned that it was unwise to perform any labor without first having received a considerable portion of their pay. When once they accepted money, however, their own custom and the law of the land provided that they must carry out their obligations. Failure to do so meant legal punishment. Consequently, when an unfortunate Pampaconas Indian found he had a dollar in his hand, he bemoaned his fate, but realized that service was inevitable. In vain did he plead that he was busy, that his crops needed attention, that his family could not spare him, that he lacked food for a journey. Condoré and Mogrovejo were accustomed to all varieties of excuses. They succeeded in engaging half a dozen carriers. Before dark we reached the village of Pampaconas, a few small huts scattered over grassy hillsides, at an elevation of ten thousand feet. In the notes of one of the military advisers of Viceroy Francisco de Toledo is a reference to Pampaconas as a high, cold place. This is correct. Nevertheless, I doubt if the present village is the Pampaconas mentioned in the documents of Garcia's day as being an important town of the Incas. There are no ruins hereabouts. The huts of Pampaconas were newly built of stone and mud, and thatched with grass. They were occupied by a group of sturdy mountain Indians who enjoyed unusual freedom from official or other interference, and a good place in which to raise sheep and cultivate potatoes, on the very edge of the dense forest. We found that there was some excitement in the village because on the previous night a jaguar, or possibly a cougar, had come out of the forest, attacked, killed, and dragged off one of the village ponies. We were conducted to the dwelling of a stocky, well-built Indian named Guzman, the most reliable man in the village, who had been selected to be the head of the party of carriers that was to accompany us to Conservidayoc. Guzman had some Spanish blood in his veins, although he did not boast of it. With his wife and six children, he occupied one of the best huts. A fire in one corner frequently filled it with acrid smoke. It was very small and had no windows. At one end was a loft where family treasures could be kept dry and reasonably safe from molestation. Piles of sheepskins were arranged for visitors to sit upon. Three or four rude niches in the walls served in lieu of shelves and tables. The floor of well-trodden clay was damp. 
three mongrel dogs and a flea-bitten cat were welcome to share the narrow space with the family and their visitors a dozen hogs entered stealthily and tried to avoid attention by putting a muffler on involuntary grunts they did not succeed and were violently ejected by a boy with a whip only to return again and again each time to be driven out as before squealing loudly notwithstanding these interruptions we carried on a most interesting conversation with guzman he had been to conservidayoc and had himself actually seen ruins at espiritu pampa at last the mythical pampa of ghosts began to take on in our minds an aspect of reality even though we were careful to remind ourselves that another very trustworthy man had said he had seen ruins finer than Ollantaytambo near Huadquiña. Guzmán did not seem to dread Conservidayoc as much as the other Indians, only one of whom had ever been there. To cheer them up we purchased a fat sheep, for which we paid fifty cents. Guzmán immediately butchered it in preparation for the journey. Although it was August, in the middle of the dry season, rain began to fall early in the afternoon. Sergeant Carrasco arrived after dark with our pack animals, but missing the trail as he neared Guzman's place, one of the mules stepped into a bog and was extracted only with considerable difficulty. We decided to pitch our small pyramidal tent on a fairly well-drained bit of turf not far from Guzman's little hut. In the evening, after we had had a long talk with the Indians, we came back through the rain to our comfortable little tent, only to hear various and sundry grunts emerging therefrom. We found that during our absence a large sow and six fat young pigs, unable to settle down comfortably at the Guzman's hearth, had decided that our tent was much the driest available place on the mountainside, and that our blankets made a particularly attractive bed. They had considerable difficulty in getting out of the small door as fast as they wished. Nevertheless, the pouring rain and the memory of comfortable blankets caused the pigs to return at intervals. As we were starting to enjoy our first nap, Guzman, with hospitable intent, sent us two bowls of steaming soup, which at first glance seemed to contain various sizes of white macaroni, a dish of which one of us was particularly fond. The white, hollow cylinders proved to be extraordinarily tough, not the usual kind of macaroni. As a matter of fact, we learned that the evening meal which Guzman's wife had prepared for her guests was made chiefly of sheep's entrails. Rain continued without intermission during the whole of a very cold and dreary night. Our tent, which had never been wet before, leaked badly. The only part which seemed to be thoroughly waterproof was the floor. As day dawned, we found ourselves to be lying in puddles of water. Everything was soaked. Furthermore, rain was still falling. While we were discussing the situation and wondering what we should cook for breakfast, the faithful Guzman heard our voices, and immediately sent us two more bowls of hot soup, which were this time more welcome, even though among the bountiful corn, beans, and potatoes, we came unexpectedly upon fragments of the teeth and jaws of the sheep. Evidently in Pampaconas nothing is wasted. End of section 23